Right, welcome to this meeting of the Central Otago District Council. Um, a slight difference today. I'm going to be in the chair. His worship is joining by teams. And he's not able to be with us in person. Let's we get what he's got. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. Um, and what I would like to do um, at the outset, please, is that to um, not to find a bit of paper. Um, Acknowledge the recent um, passing of um, past uh, Councillor Barry Becker, um, who was on the Manitoba Committee Board from November 95 through to 2013, um, and chaired that board in 2010 to 2013. He was a council on CODC from 2007 through to 2013, and was on the road actually um, during that period as well. So, an article of stand please for the summer. Thanks, everybody. Hi, this is Richard Barry in advance. Um, he was one of the guys with a very reason and sound mind, um, said what needed to be said. Um, and all the dry suits and people. Yes, he was. Yeah, so it's true. You've got the big shoes to still fill, mate. Right? Okay. Right, out. that done. Um, just confirm, Your Worship, you are there online? Certainly am. Thank you, Neil. Excellent. Um, okay, uh, just a quick note too. There is an item on the agenda that um, I would normally lead, which is the one about the hearings, the hearing appointment of the hearings panel commissioners. I twice is still um, leading me into that part, but along with the other people noting that the report will probably not partake in the discussion or the voting on it. All that, so that's not the three awards. Um, and we'll move now to uh, the confirmation of the minutes on page seven. Agenda. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't miss out public forum because there isn't one. <coughs> uh, declaration of interest, uh, just to remind everybody to um, make sure that they are aware of their potential conflicts and um, other matters. Will there be any changes to that registry at the or today? Thank you. Let's move then to our report section of the agenda. And the first one is um, 22.6.2. I hand over to Stephen to lead us through the economic development and community facilities part of the agenda. So on page 28. And on that note, who's this? Rebecca Sear, Alan Brown. I will introduce. Oh, you're on the board, sir. I'll hand it over to you. Oh, kia ora koutou. Um, thank you for having me here today. So this is the um, Sport Otago's annual grant accountability report back, and I will soon be joined by um, Owen Booth from Sport Otago and Joe Knight and Ella Brown from Sport Central, and they've got a, a presentation to run through. Um, I've got just very brief opening comments. So we last year you granted Sport Otago uh, 41,549. $1,549 and, um, and, and as a result of that, the um, organisation signs an MOU with our Parks and Recreation team um, and does a series of projects across the district for, on, um, for us. And so that's all I have to say and I'm here to answer any questions um, once the presentation's been. Um, oh, the last thing I'd say is that currently the grants applications Currently, so there's an application in from Sport Otago for the 2022-23 financial year. They're currently being assessed and will be presented to the September Council meeting for your decision. So I'll hand over to Ms. Gus. Thank you. Uh, Kia ora yeah, uh, My name is Alan Booth. Um, I'm the general manager of programs at Sport Otago. Um, Ella Brown and Joe Knight. Um, they're going to talk a little bit about their roles shortly, so I'll, I'll leave that for, for the presentation. Um, just quickly from me, um, this is the 21st year now we're, we're entering in for Sport Central. Um, so, um, CDC has been a, a partner and a funder of, of that program for us um, for all of those 21 years. 
Um, so obviously we're, we're very grateful for that ongoing support. Um, over that time we've grown um, initially with just the one person uh, in 2001. Uh, 15 years ago we brought in a second person. Um, three years ago, um, in addition to the two roles we have here, um, Tony Carruthers, um, he started in Wanaka. Um, so he works primarily in the QLDC district, but does do some work over into CLDC as well. Um, and just in the last uh, four months, uh, we brought in a fourth person uh, based in Cromwell. Um, so they're working out of Junction Health Medical Centre there um, as a health coach um, and also doing some uh, green prescription work for us as well. Um, so helping people um, to get physically active um, and just recovering from injury illness. Um, we just need a bit of a hand to get started. So we're up to up to four staff um, working in the CRDC region at the moment. Um, so yeah, growing quite a bit. Um, we've uh, obviously submitted a, a written report, but um, that you've got in front of you there. But I guess a lot of what we do is best represented um, in person and in pictures. Um, so Joe and Anna are going to take you through a bit of um, what a bit about their roles um, and what they've been up to over the last year. So, thank you. So, Kawaiyo, um, I'm Jo Knight. Um, I am the Community Sport and Active Recreation Advisor, and my office is based in Cromwell, but obviously I work throughout the area. And um, Ella Brown is the P and Play Advisor. Kia ora. So, um, as the P and Play Advisor, I sort of covered two of the key pillars by Sport New Zealand, one being physical education and the other being play. Um, and so part of this is to deliver and sort of help support the teachers in this space in the primary schools and preschools through a series of programs. Um, on your marks, stage one is preschool level, on your marks, stage two is primary school, so years one to three. And then the physical activity leaders is the seniors at that primary school age group. And then in the play space, um, also help deliver wriggle and rhyme within the library space. So um, one of the key goals is to enhance participation in physical activity. And so um, as you can see here, a few photos are from the PALS group down at Goldfields. We also partnered with CODC and did a walk and wear week um, this year. And hopefully we're going to continue that um, next year as well. Wriggle and Rhyme is the music and movement program. And um, yeah, it's just a series of photos to demonstrate visually um, the energy that comes through the physical activity space at preschool and primary school. Highlight here for me is the PALS program. This has really taken off this year. Um, we've worked with nine schools in the CODC region, which is about 190 ish students. Um, so my role there is to work with them in a small group basis for them to then build their capacity and capability to then work um, with others in their community and school to um, promote more physical activity opportunities. And it's a really rewarding program and it gets me out and about with this group, um, different schools in the regions, which I love. Right. And uh, my role, I guess, um, is it's different to Ella's in that I work probably with from uh, high school upwards. So um, here the pictures I've got are of the we reignite of the Cornwall Junior Tennis. We had over 30 children turn up to that. That's exciting. Um, the middle photo is the uh, work we did with harvest workers. Um, we organised a um, sports night for them at the end of January and that was quite popular and then a barbecue and pool party at the Cromwell Pool in February and I think we had about 40 people turn up to that and uh, they were really appreciative of the community putting that on for them. Uh, and the, the photo on the right is the Central Otago Friendship Network. Um, so a great bunch of young people who were physically inactive, I would say, in their meetings. And then um, I've been working with them for about a year now and um, yeah, getting them active. I work probably every every other month with them. And we've recently um, they've received some funding from our Sport Otago administered to Manawa Fund for some curling lessons and also um, to get some sports equipment of their own so that they can now be active hopefully every session. Uh, and then I'll still continue working with them. Um, so another goal, community capacity and capability. Um, facilitated a sports strapping course in Cromwell for uh, team managers and the like. Um, worked with Dunstan High School in their uh, Relay Your Way, which was a fundraiser for Relay for Life. They raised over a thousand dollars and we they use uh, inflatables and uh, we organised a disc golf for them. 
uh, we worked with Connect Cromwell to get the disc golf course uh, put into Anderson Park in, uh, in Cromwell and uh, to Manawa fund um, funded that project. Uh, and it's been really cool to see the, the different demographics getting out there on the course being active. Um, the photo on the top right is from Top Bike, so that's over 300 uh, tamariki get together for some bike skills and fun team racing at Molyneux New Park. That was put off a couple of times this year, but we finally got it going on a frosty day in May. Um, and then uh, we worked with the Central Otago Primary School Sports Association, uh, helping them out with their events, uh, which is touch athletics, swimming, cross country, I think. There, uh, bottom right photo is Special Olympics. Um, that's another group. They were previously sort of inactive. Um, they have been inactive for a while around Central Otago, and they are now up and running again. And so the Friendship Network is attending their sessions, and we've got the Mint Group from Wanaka coming down as well. And that's been an amazing um, community building uh, exercise as well as um, sporting opportunity for the, that group of people. And um, and the Good Sports yeah. logo is on there as well because they've been doing some work with um, some sports in Central and that is starting to grow as well. So that's a culture change initiative um, sort of aimed at educating parents about sideline behaviour and um, making sure children have a great experience in sport. Yeah. and uh, collaborating to drive positive change. Um, we've established a regional facility steering group representative of all the council, five councils around Otago and um, major community funders. So that's going to be an important project um, that's ongoing. Um, through COVID, uh, I've spent a lot of time online liaising with um, school sports coordinators um, and often, well, we gave them a presentation um, about what resources we have to offer and promoting the It's My Move campaign. The Goose Chase app, which some of you might have heard about, and, and Good Sports, which I've just spoken. Um, and <clears throat> we have um, carried out a club needs survey here in Central, and that is a really important ongoing project that we're working with CLT for um, mentoring and governance. So there's a lot of sports clubs out there that need that at the moment, and not just sports clubs, other community organisations. So watch this space. And then um, we supported the Rocks Report upgrade um, with their funding application um, to the UAA. Also, aside from all the equipment, the resources, the delivery and sort of community work we do, we also um, really value doing some like development for ourselves. And so these are some examples of things that we've partaken in or um, had the opportunity to go on for further development. Um, I'm part of the Next Gen Network, which is like a young woman um, network of people who work in sport and rec or have a passion for it um, and attending the Women in Sport Conference this year. Um, we also do some leadership training. We go to Sport New Zealand Hui's. Um, we've been doing some cultural competency work where we're learning te reo. Um, and yeah, really important for us to sort of connect across the motu and like um, Aotearoa as a whole to learn and develop new, new ideas so we can sort of pick and choose and generate those in our own region as well. So yeah, learning. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much for your contribution to um, yeah, to our roles and, and what we are um, able to offer in the community. Thank you. That was a very top piece of report, so thank you. And that's all work you guys do, so much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. One of our, I'm obviously from the Mini Toto, one of our biggest concerns we've got there is ageing population and small clubs getting smaller and cost of funding. I'm speaking mainly about the bowling clubs here, the free bowling clubs are struggling to get funds, are struggling to get new members. Do you see a role on trying to deal with fraud and hopefully in the parks and rec budget to make it maintaining greens at the expense of some of other sports fields? Because a lot of our kids are going to come this way for tracks or netball courts or whatever they want to do. Have you had much experience in the elderly population? And what can you do to help with the loss of many total bowling systems? In terms of bowling income specifically, um, we, we have got a staff member um, in Dunedin who has done quite a bit of work um, in that space around working with bowls clubs, looking at entry mergers, um, looking at funding, um, strategic plans, and facilities as a whole. Um, so in terms of where it sort of fits, it fits within uh, Joe's role, but these people, uh, both Joe and Alan, have got a whole lot of resources back in Dunedin to come forward as well. Um, so in terms of skill set, capacity, um, Alan Nichols, he's happy to have a lot of 
Thank you, yeah. Sandra, talked about that. Yes, and I did, in terms of funding, there's a funding clinic coming up, I think it is on the 7th of September in yeah. Manfrilly, and um, I do know there is... Well, in the sports... Uh, it could be anything. The community yeah. trust. And yeah. the money title, there's a funding clinic on the, um, at the Rehabilitation Service Centre on the 7th of September. That's for all, that's a title community trust will be there, CODC will be there. And the other one is going to be and I do know the Gaming Trust has got some money for, that has to be given away in your area. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, cool. Yeah. Right, so I will get involved with that. It's sure. not on the last year. Yeah. 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 Would that include work from the Greens and smaller places? It, it, it depends on the funds and what yeah. funder you go to because they've all got the various criteria. So what, what Alan or Joe could do is to help try and find out what are the particular funds that are going to help a particular organisation with what their needs are? Yeah. I mean, maintenance upkeep is 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 a valid um, funder thing to be funded for many organisations. Because the greens have to be a certain standard, don't they? For central bowling tournaments, it's going to be pretty hard for elderly bowlers. Yeah. Yeah. Question from Tanya. Sorry, sorry. Before we go on, just really, can you make sure you anyway that in talk this way so Tim will hear because. Well, well, sorry, yeah, sorry, 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 the Water Skills for Life program, which is awesome in the primary school. Just wonder, do you guys do any work with adults with water safety skills? Not. Not other than the, mm. the harvest yeah, yeah, that is something I've actually been asked about that in Wanaka from different cultural groups. So it might be something that we could look into, um, and it could be something that then maybe we might be able to get funding <coughs> for if we were, yeah, if we worked with um, the full team opposite me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Probably just prefacing um, the September meeting um, for councillors, but I did the um, calculations for the 41,500 that we've been paying since 2015, that would equate to 51,000 um, through inflation. Uh, that was last year before inflation even hit 7%. So just making that comment before we have our discussions in September about ongoing funding. Good comment. Thank you, man. It's not you. Any further questions? Okay. Just a little plug for me. I hope you're still um, at a high level looking at how you can centralise some of the sporting activity that we've got in Central Tarnia to reduce the travel for some of the families. So particularly those that don't have the money in their pocket and the price of fuel at the moment makes it even worse. It's always an issue. It's always, it's always there, isn't it? Yeah. So if there's no further questions, once again, thank you guys for your awesome work. So I appreciate it. Yeah, so thank you for having us and thank you again for your support. Um, can someone move that you see the report? Oh, the 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 thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's move on now to Get on number three, which is Bain Chain Quarterly and Warren Court decision. Um, and we're going to take us through that, and you're also going to do the next one up as well. So, to go to um, page 53, and we'll quickly take you through the outcome of Bain Chain Quarterly and the Warren Court decisions. Thank you, Neil. Um, so uh, most of you will be aware that um, Plan Change 14 is, um, was Private Plan Change Lodge with Council in 2019 um, to develop an area of rural land on Rippendale Road near Cromwell. Uh, the proposal was to create up to 160 allotments um, with areas of between 2,000 and 3,000, uh, sorry, 2,000 square metres and three hectares. Um, it was quite a departure from the district plan as it stands at the moment. And there was, um, uh, of the, the Shannon Farm is the farm that, that was being subdivided. Of that um, 244 hectare farm, 142 hectares was um, related to this and the rest would remain in rural. Um, an independent panel was appointed with Councillor Gillespie and um, an independent planning consultant, Gary Ray. 
uh, to hear the plan change. Um, the recommendation from them to council was to decline the private plan change, however, acknowledging that it was finely balanced. There were a number of um, things that um, a number of reasons why around uh, productivity and landscape and a few other things, um, but it was finely balanced. Subsequently, the, um, the proponents of the plan change appealed the decision um, to the Environment Court and Council entered into mediation with the parties. Um, an agreement was reached between um, Council and, um, and the proponents and the um, submitters on a more nuanced um, outcome. So if you, in, in your report, in the report, you see uh, figures two and four. So figure two was what was proposed originally, and figure four is the outcome of the plan change um, in terms of the environment court mediation. So the mediation um, involved significant landscape and expert evidence being brought to play. So a number of alterations were made to it. So it's a far more nuanced uh, outcome that reflects uh, what's actually going on on the, la on the ground, visibility, landscape and a few other things. Um, <clears throat> so that we've ended up with a, uh, oh, sorry, the result of this is we've got a fifth re rural resource area. The rural resource area um, allows for six different, six distinct life cycle and rural lifestyle areas, um, varying from an average of 2,000, there's a 3,000, 4,000, and 8,000 in a three hectare. And then in the production area, which is where the cherries, et cetera, will be, will be a minimum of four hectares in there in terms of allotment sizes. Um, so I guess that. Um, we're in the process at the moment of mapping this. It's um, you see from um, figure four that the, it's tricky to map on the GIS. Um, one thing that they had, we had received it in a um, in just a PDF format. So we went back and said we our mapping is now GIS. So we're working on what that actually looks like. So um, yeah, happy to take any questions on on this. Thanks, Anne. Just to probably add to that a little bit. Well, figure four, you know, tax areas of the no build areas. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and the landscape is a significant, yeah. significant amenity landscape. Yeah. Is what that's called. So that was part of the landscape and so sort of things. Yeah. And the, the big push was on those <coughs> bottom soils, which are away in the five class soils, which I suppose as good as you'll get, although through the process, it's determined that actually most of our soils will grow anything that we want on them. Um, but yeah. you've got to start with this one. So, um, yeah. yeah. The weird thing about this is that because it's an environmental decision, there's no decision required by council, which doesn't make any sense to me one little bit. It just seems bizarre that someone just says, comes over the top and says, bang, this is in your plan. Yeah. So, yeah any other questions? Very so the environment court recommendations on top of what the others are in the red. Is that that's what the red is? <coughs> yes, yes. So, so that's the red business identified in the um in the, one of the appendices is the changes. So changes. The, the, under, the, the red underlined is the changes that have been made as a result of the, no, the, the, the environment, environment court mediation. It's the consent order that they issued. Oh, okay. So that's where that's come from. Yeah, yeah. And as Neil's pointed out, there's no build areas. That's part of the nuancing of the plan is that you'll see that it's a lot more broken up. There's more no build areas and the ONL is completely protected. So it's, it's a better outcome. And I think it's part of remembering there's going to be an underpass. No, would they get underpass or not? No, no I don't think that's cycle, cycle paths are pretty cycling, yes. so yes. yeah. yeah, there's, there's cycling connectivity in, in some of those other mm -hmm. So, could I ask about reverse sensitivity with this change? Is everyone comfortable that that's been covered off adequately? And I guess if the, the warrant court rules that way, it is. That's, that's the only response you can give, whether you're comfortable or not. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I I wasn't so a party yeah, to the so yeah. yeah. Welcome to the RMA process. Yeah. Before. So so this this is um this new zone has been created. Um so it is in now, so we could expect to receive uh to start receiving applications on this. Yeah. Um, we're just, yeah, like I said, just in the process of getting this onto our GIS map and um, Tony's working on that. It's a little bit complex. Um, it's got lots of lovely mm -hmm. curves in it. <laughs> so, 
And you might see that the rest of the media that one of the outcomes is that there's a cycle, a mountain bike course yeah. 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 um, which is part of it, which is a, a good outcome in respect to that. Yeah, it is really good. And, and one of the things that's in the provisions that's come out of it is that um, any of those kind of trails or anything like that don't form part of minimum allotment sizes or anything like that. So they can't be contributed back to that. So that access ways. Um, there is an commitment, Stephen, there's a few conditions about noise and reverse sensitivity in um, the rooms under the um, uh, Voice, audible bird to terrible devices. It's quite a bit of red lining on there. Whether yeah. it's sufficient, only time will tell. And said too, the other thing about this was that, that the decision that we made to decline was really finely balanced. It was. And it was, you know, it, it made a lot of sense for a lot of good reasons. Um, and in the end, the outcome was, it was better. Um, yeah. And the landscape evidence and the soils evidence were two key things. And in the end, when you get in a situation where you have experts, in landscape and in um, soils, yeah. that almost takes anything else you might have a view about out of it because the experts on the have the, the sway. So yes. Yeah. Mm. Anything else? So I'll like move that we um, that we received, please. Um, second of any, all of that. Against carried, thank you. Um, I will now move to item number 22.6.4 on page 201. <coughs> And um, ask Anne to take you through that report on the deployment of hearing spell commitments. Um, I will chair the meeting for this part only, um, but along with um, councillors, McPherson, Jeffrey, and Kearney, we will not partake in any discussion or deliberations on the matter, seeing it involves us. Over to you, Anne. Thank you. Um, Session Lee's report, but um, he's not here. Yes, sorry. Yeah, he's not, yeah, sure <laughs> explain, yeah, Lee's not here because yeah. he's. he's um, Affected by COVID, well, he's not personally, but he's got kind of some problems. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Thank you. Um, so the, the report is around um, maintaining um, decision making through the election period, post election period, until we understand um, what that looks like. Um, the recommendation is to appoint um, the independent panel, which consists of um, the, the current panel. Um, and but also includes um, Councillor Jeffries, who is not standing this time to be appointed as an independent to to maintain that stability until we know what what might happen going forward with the councils and what decisions council might make after the elections. Um, one of the things that just I had a brief discussion with Councillor Gillespie before. One thing I've noted here is that um, Councillor McPherson is indicated as a deputy chair. Um, I've confirmed with Martin that he's he doesn't hold chair certification, so he can't be appointed as a deputy chair. Um, so um, we, I think if we could make an amendment that the recommendation would be in the event that Councillor um, Gillespie is unavailable for whatever reason to chair the hearings panel, that an independent chair be appointed. So that would be the recommendation. Any questions of Anne? I'd be happy to move with that um, alteration. Cool. I'm going to suggest that all needs to come out is that after Martin first and take out be appointed as deputy as the independent deputy chair of the hearings panel. Just take that part out. Yes, sir, okay. The issue then about um, if I can't chair a meeting, there's already a procedure in place there's to be the deputy chair, so it doesn't need to be in this resolution. There's already something that covers this. Yeah. yeah. I understand it. So. Sits with the yeah. So Shirley's moved that. Someone like a second with that amendment? Oh, too slow. <laughs> All in favour? Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, let's then move on to item number five, which is dog control policy and practice and report. I understand that we're going to be calling um, leads not here. So, Tony and um, Blair Bridgley, who's our animal control officer, is that the right to call it to? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. Right. present the dog control policy and practice report, which we wait, they usually wait every year to get. Well, not much to introduce, but yes, it is um, just for your information, and it's about the last 12 months of um, control practices um, in, the, in the dog space, uh, dog control space, and I'm um, really happy to answer any questions you have on that. Anybody any questions for? Seems like there are more dogs, but maybe not more dogs, just more dogs being registered. 
Ich ist ein Satz weiter. Just just a coin. Giving just go you leave. Which is registered. The closed dog park. It's amazing to contain a dog. It's I've just found the east there. What dog park? Taking a dog out to run. Taking a dog out to run, that's a puppy and just take it. And it's all fence and it's it's even got Pieces and letters and so that was one more. It's fantastic. So it's a great, great community project. That's a community project. Yeah. Well, Your Worship, you got a question, I believe? Yeah, and look, it might be impossible to answer it, but I'm wondering at point E where you say there's a 10% reduction in the number of roaming dog complaints and a 37% increase in barking dogs, but the numbers 21 and 24 are similar. Does this mean that the people who used to let their dogs roam just now tie them up and neglect them and they sit there barking all day, or is that just a fluke? <laughs> so that, um, pretty much, yes, we're finding that um, the complaints are changing from dogs roaming to dogs. People are complaining more about dogs barking now, so um, that's where that's coming from. Problems remain with the owners, not the dogs. Yeah, problems yeah. always with the owners, not the dogs generally. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I think Blair, um, seeing the engagement that's out there on social media and other places with, with the volume you've got and the van and, and the approachability of having it in house is, I think, paying dividends in space. So we're just pulled by the team to, to do that and it's working quite well. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Cheryl. So I, just, I do have one question, and it's still with the little registration date. Are they uh, the dogs required to have that in the next four times? When they're in public, yes. So when they're on their own property, they don't have to have their collar or tag on. But the minute they're off their property, the collar and tag is required. My dog eats this. <laughs> <laughs> well, get some sort of collar on your dog. So what I suggest to some people is attach it to the lead. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. It's not technically correct, but it solves a lot of issues. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's just further that I see in Christchurch City that they've gone to a renewable tag. Yes, are we, we're heading that way, I believe, are we? We're looking at it. Because I've got quite a collection of those colours. Mm -hmm. And they're all dogs getting way down there because they're the ones with the collie, see? Mm -hmm. So the tag we're looking at is called a lifetime tag. Yeah, so it'd be issued to the dog for all the life of the dog. Register the kids, I can put that on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, something that gives you a life, though. And plus, I'm like, my kids, too. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, any other questions? Um, recommendation is that we receive the reports and we'll like to move in that direction. Tracy, look for me, I'll see you in the payments here next. Thank you. We'll take it. Gary. Thanks, guys. Okay, um, then I'm moving on to um, three waters and waste part of the agenda. Then I'll, I'll hand over to Nigel to bring in item 22.6.6 on page 213. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we've got um, 32.6 in seconds on page 13, and we have Julie just speak to that again, right? Thank you, Julie. So I'll take the report as being read. And I think everybody's well aware of the um, event that happened in Fevers about three, four weeks ago now that um, inundated the Omicow ponds. So the ponds were built in 1965. Um, and if we had, with the benefit of hindsight, we could go back in time and tell them to put them up a bit higher, we would do that. Um, but it's the second time they've flooded in the last five years. So um, there is a, um, a business case being developed and we'd already begun that process before this event happened to, to move them. However, that's going to be a massive uh, project. Um, because we've got issues at Alexandra now, we are look, uh, not issues at Alexandra now, we have, have coming to the end of a consent period for the Alexandra Wastewater 
treatment plant as well, and we've got five years on the um, Omicare site. Is, so we're looking at potentially a combined option for land disposal um, for those two sites. Um, so it is, it is a large project to do investigations on and foster, but it'll be a significantly expensive project when it, when it gets implemented. So we did get away relatively lightly with the damage that happened at the site. Initially, we thought um, it was going to be quite significant um, because of the, um, the flood came right up. The only thing you could see was the top of the security fence and the solar panel. Um, but once the um, water had receded, um, we, we, because we had put the security fence around that site, we believed that the, um, that all the tree debris kind of uh, pushed up against the fence that almost acted as a bit of a filter for the gravel and sediment that had previously gone into the ponds. So um, while there were some logs, once the fence came down, the logs went into the ponds. Once we had moved that out, um, there wasn't as much damage as to anything that we thought. So we are recommending that the, um, the cost of responding to that event is funded from the emergency funding provisions because um, our operate, it's all operational cost and our operational budgets for three waters is um, incredibly tight. Um, and we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll end up with an overspend if we don't um, fund it from that allocation. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, so I think it'd be fair to say we dodged the bullet a little bit. Um, I think we dodged a bullet in terms of expense. Yeah. I think, you know, everyone in our team um, was pretty upset about the potential environmental implications of the ponds being inundated. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do when a river's coming up like that. You, you, you can put all the air out there you want, but you can't stop the water coming up and flooding and ponds. And, and, but in particular, the, given the events of 2017 and 18 with the silk and gravel yeah. and, the, and the cost of that, yeah. remediating that, <clears throat> yeah. that it didn't occur in this event, it was, that was good news. Any questions? Yeah. Comments? Uh, why wouldn't we consider it as an overspend and carry it on our books as, a, as an overspend? Um, well, it would be so you, it would be an authorised increase to the budget rather than an overspend, which you would then fund on your reserves. I think that option's put in before this has been put on fly. I think. <laughs> Oh, I'm thinking about if it's just status of debt, we then have the people which do this at all. Yeah, that, that of course is an option. The option we could take, actually, the one that we take is if we were running the business, yeah. not, not with you as to where it might be going to end up. Oh. Yes, <laughs> you'll know that's the one to <laughs> Sure, though. <laughs> you'll leave, it's all right for you. Yes. <laughs> Therefore, why would it be just a cost overrun on a day to day business we're running anyway? To a fund from somewhere. I think it's Yeah, but then you've got to, you, you you to count it out and definitely pay it, so you don't, you don't, don't want to run a budget and deficit. Isn't the reason to have that three point we want a million dollars in that jar is for specifically for this sort of thing? I don't know, just in the interest. Sorry, just about to say. Sorry, <laughs> Jason. No idea. I was just actually going to say exactly what Stu just said. So, Which I was, probably get yeah, it. They funds here for okay for a service trip, but it didn't work for bridges. I should probably oh. clarify there. Um, so, that uh, we used to have a separate fund for Rodent, and um, we've actually merged all the funds together now. So, that's been a relatively recent thing to merge it together into one emergency response fund instead of having separate ones for the different activities. Um, with Rodent, We've always um, we put fifty thousand dollars a year aside um, to accumulate up a fund, as with the expectation that Waka Katahi will fund um, this year plus more because when it's an emergency response, they they fund a higher share because the replacement of the bridge wasn't considered to be um, the the age of the bridge was a significant factor in the deterioration that happened. Sorry, it's just... Oh, Tim, thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Julie, I'm just wanting clarification in case I'm asked in the future. On page 214, we say that the peak flow exceeded 500 cubes, but in the table, it actually shows it peaking at 430. What was it? It was over 500 
Your Worship. Um, I think uh, initial estimates from um, emergency management indicated that it could take it possibly close to 600. But I think it was closer to the 500. So what the table shows? But how does how does the table show a peak of 4,000? I think this, the table only shows it going up to 4, uh, 430, but uh, I think it's gone beyond that. Yeah, I think it, that's uh, did right in. I asked the IRC about that um, when we were out looking at the sites on, on the day. And they said it was over there and says they can't uh, they can only update the tables at a certain point and so it came up to the highest point and beyond it for the tables now so that doesn't mean it was only 2 4 30 that's as high as they can show it on the table so, so their measuring equipment can only go to 4 30. no they have to change the tables manually as it happens or, or after it happens so this was what it was showing yes okay all right that that seems bizarre but somehow that doesn't surprise me Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, so if the ORC have been um, acknowledged in terms of you told them that this event happened, are they going to do anything about it? So they have been monitoring our response really closely. Uh, we, we've been giving them Initially, we've given them daily updates. Um, they've visited the site several times, and yesterday some of the same stuff visited the site as well. Um, the feedback from the ORC staff has been that they have been appreciative of the um, extent to which the council res responded to the event, and we did everything that was possible, plus some, to um, try and mitigate the situation and get plans back to the operating performance. So you're not going to get fine mm -hmm. We, we, we will have to wait and see. What I would say is if, if we behave negligently, then I would expect that we would be in line for a fine. Um, I, I think we would have a very good case to show that we have done everything that was possible under the circumstances um, of the flood occurring. And, and you know, it, as I explained around the, um, the, the proposal to do something different at that site, but th there's not a really quick short term solution that you can take that you can get a consent for. Um, it's actually quite a long term process to work through that. Um, uh, just a really a comment, I guess, is that um, I thought just first of all, I thought the comms were at the time of the event, which is um, great because everyone knew what was happening mm -hmm. and it was 100% honest. So that was, I thought that was good, especially coming from Omega. Um, and that was what the people said. However, I think the critical part now is that we keep the community involved, not involved, sorry, to keep the community updated as to what's happening. And it doesn't feel like that event happened, but nothing else is happening underneath. So it's just about keeping that communication open so people know that we haven't, it hasn't fallen off. Um, essentially council's radar, just making sure that it's oh, very much it won't have because it's part of the new consent that we've got issued. We have to carry on looking at the options for um, removing the discharge from the river and potentially relocating that site. So yeah. very much it'll yeah. just keeping people up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um recognising that there's no quick fix for that, are there any changes to our operating procedures for that site if the river starts rising again? Difficult, isn't it? It's because it's not the way we're operating this site. It's um, just in terms of is there anything that you can do to prepare for RRCs indicating that the river is going to reach that level again? Is there anything that we can do once we get into that version? No, no will be a short answer to that. Um, we had this conversation <clears> as <throat> it was happening in the evening. We need to me up in a panic and say this is looking possible. And, and, and it's like when that kind of force of nature is happening, there's very little that you can do to avoid that. One, one thing that we, could, uh, we have done is make sure that the fence has been reinstated. Because that has held back a lot of the damage. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's very little as, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to help Tim out. Um, Tim, that table that's in the report is taken straight from the council's website, which shows a six month period of flows. So it's just the scale of the graph that's on the public available website. I know for a fact that it was over 1200 because I've seen the raw data. 
um, but it's just the way it's represented on the regional council website. So, oh, that's not that's like, helpful. Not, they can't do it, they are doing it, it's just the way it's represented. So, and I think it's because that's the number I've been using, but it's it's fascinating, isn't it, that there's another council arguing over whether the minimum flow should be two or three kumik, and here we are at 500. Just shows what an angry river it can be when it puts its mind to it and the exceptional size of this event. So, in the future, and obviously with the current consent, there'll be no reason why you can't bung around the outside of that pond another metre higher and keep the fence a metre higher than that, would not. The cheapest option for everyone. Um, on strength of the fence. Higher than a metre. I think when we were out there with the um, ORC yesterday, uh, one of their team sort of estimated that we were talking about like an eight metre rise between normal flow and what it was on the day. So it would be a reasonably significant bond. Right. But it's not undoable. And you've got gravity in the river that should be coming out of one of those rivers anyway. And make the channel meter would just let me double whammy, wouldn't it? So engineering wise, it would be more than just putting in a gravel bund because that would just the river would just wash yeah. wash that away too. Um, it, it's going to it, it would be it would be a yes. Yes, you could put in a flood bank protection of some sort. Um that would come, it would be a significant flood bank and it would come at quite a significant cost. And I think the options that we are looking at would will provide a better long term solution in terms of a better discharge quality discharge away from the river. So, so even yeah, and the ultimate goal is to get the discharge away from the river. Okay, I just want to. Well, I ask for a move and second it. We are happy with the response that the funding for this event of 165,000 could properly come out of the emergency event reserve um, from the business as usual. Okay, no. Thank you. You wouldn't get it reinvest though if you're applying through the three waters situation though if it's coming out of an emergency management bank. That's just a common. Yeah, now just to okay, no silence. I to just start you sideways, Ian Judy, the um situation with drinking water at Naseby, which is noted in the report, is that a cause for congratulation that the there were no that in a, an event of that size you didn't have to go to issuing a boil water notice. We were very happy about that. The plant was able to continue to produce water, albeit at a reduced capacity. Although we are uh, still somewhat nervous around the fact that this event happened did not happen at a peak period, and we know Naysby's offer needs to operate at peak capacity during peak periods to keep up with demand. And so if this had happened in January, we, we could have been facing a different out outcome. So while we've made some improvements that certainly um, at the peak we've made some investment in the plant that certainly is reducing the, the risk, the but risk has not well, been completely continue. eliminated. Yeah. Um, we well, need to continue looking at alternative water sources. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that is a plus. And, that, was, and that we're working on that as well. It was a very good trial for the additional plant we had there, and yeah, we're happy with the way that, that turned out. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay, so we've got on page 213 recommendations A and B, do I have an E and second? Ian? Gerald? Any further discussion? All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Julie, thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, let's move now to item number 22.6.7, which is verification of resolution 22.2.3, proposal of land to Wakatoe, and we'll hand over to Stu. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, I'll just read the first one out first. Um, it's item number 22.6.7. To dispose of land and from all the work Good morning, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, at the meeting of 
21 June, uh, the Council Community Board consider a, a report um, regarding the proposal to dispose of approximately 1740 square metres of record of Title 13B 1860 to Wako Katahi New Zealand Transport Agency. The purpose of the disposal is to fill a facilitate the construction of um, the roundabout, commonly referred to as the Wooing Tree Roundabout. Um, as noted in the delegations, community boards um, do not have the authority to um, acquire, hold or dispose of land. So to give effect to the resolution, we're here today to ask you to um, ratify the board's decision and agree to the proposal to um, dispose of 1740 square metres of the Big Fruit Reserve to Waka Kotahi to accept the payment of $118,000 plus GSP as compensation for the land and subject to the income being paid into the Cromwell Property General Account and held for the purposes of purchasing, enhancing and or maintaining land within the Cromwell Ward. Any questions? No, I'll move. Oh, I'll right there. No, right, so we'll move. Thank you, Trace. <laughs> in favour? Gary, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. And just oh, while I'm talking on road, yeah, there's um, a bit of a lot of discussion in our corner and I think everywhere. The state of the state highways in Pat Holland has unlearned. Um, going through from Dunedin through the big route and into Dunedin the other day, the roads are atrocious out on the fish and also on the coast and where we are. Um, and I was talking to a member of the works for Wakata in Dunedin, and they had major problems in Milton South. Um, and our own potholing, we've got a pothole in there, gravel roads, which is normal at this time of year, and the winter fall going out. And hopefully the weather settles down with dryness and gets the graders working. But these weather events, while they've been affecting the water treatment plants, and everything like that, they've made a big, massive impact on our roads. So I know the guys in the home well, gangs are going to be working really hard to get them up to date. But <laughs> well, it's about communication, many people know those things, but I definitely want to start to promote with the main state highways are in this. That's my report. Thanks. So, Kylie went to the past and it's going to be closed from next Monday, from us. Yeah, it was took a while. And Quinn and I asked Quinn to get hold of the Wapatahi Transit Museum to find out if that was going to happen in the early days, and they couldn't tell them. We turned up on the fire. We got notification, the order of St John's notification before it ended up in our notification because it was out of our district, apparently. That involves what I can tell you, so we could just finish out there. Anyway, moving on. Thank you, Mr. Tracy. Let's move out to item number 22.618, page 245. Um, housing policy encouraging use of different housing topology in the council. So, let's ask you to take us through that. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. I take the paper as read and just some very quick comments from me. Um, at your March meeting, you directed that this policy be created. Um, that, in effect, um, requires council um, and the community boards, obviously, um, through the process uh, to give consideration to accommodating different um, housing typologies with the goal that these will be more affordable than what's currently on the market. Uh, but the policy, I think, is pretty straightforward in itself. You'll see um, that I expressly state um, around council taking a leadership role and is appropriate um, through the planning process that we promote this policy to private developers as well. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Saskia. Questions? Hi. I just wondered what sort of promotion we will be doing to private developers and encourage them to take this policy. So that would be um, when they go through Louise Vanderbilt's team and um, they apply um, through the consenting process. Um, is it would be through a, a formal discussion, so it wouldn't be like um, sort of out there. It would be one-on-one -on -one conversations, is what we, we were thinking. And of course, there's no requirement um, for them. But what we're more help, hoping that if this is a roaring success and if, um, private developers see that, then naturally that they will follow our lead. Would it be fair to say that the proposal by the Cromwell Community Board affects what's in this policy? <coughs> yes. So there is a um, template coming. What is space that might be that um, encouragement to other people, just put it quite simply, it's one of the opportunities out of this is that the developer could actually maximise the return. Which benefits all around out of that process. I don't know, not a developer. 
We'll see how that happens. This is the really? Tell me what's the size that we've got to have? Surely not. <laughs> Your worships. Thank you. I'm wondering if we're missing a trick here, and that is if we wind up through this, what we're doing today, if we wind up building low rise apartments at 351,000 or whatever, where is the council policy that stops that getting bought as a holiday home for someone who's going to come down skiing from Auckland for two weeks of the year? Because if we're going to do this, there has to be a purpose at the end of it. And I don't think we can actually get the wording to do that today, but if we're building affordable housing, and, and I know some people might be going, oh, you can't manipulate the market, and I'll say to that before anyone says it, that it's bloody well manipulated already. So we need to manipulate it back. There's no point us doing this unless there's going to be benefits to our community, and yeah, we'll be making winners and losers out of it, But I, and that's why I don't think we can fix it today, but I think there might be some more work needed to say if we do build these affordable houses, there has to be some, and I'll use the word manipulation, so that the benefit accrues to our community so that our young people um, can can find a way into the housing market rather than others take advantage of it. I don't know what the wording is or the progress for that though. So in the original investment logic mapping exercise we went through, and you'll see I've listed out all the areas we looked at on the first page of my report. Um, I think in terms of the delivery and affordable housing, I think that quickly got moulded into that, that trust model. Uh, and what we have in, in Julie's um, presentation shortly for consideration under the um, Better Off funding is if Council was of a mind um, to do further work in this housing space, um, we have um, for your consideration um, put up an item there for budget to do some further work around what um, uh, what that deliverable, uh, delivering affordable housing, what else could be there. So um, there is further consideration for you to have this part of that paper today. I think that should be reflected in our recommendations, therefore, because you know, in a year's time, we look back at what we did and there's nothing in there, things can get forgotten. I think we need to tie the two together. Just my thoughts, so. though. You might want to put some words around that and plug them in an email. I'm trying, but my brain's not working. I'm making excuses. <laughs> and just um, to note, obviously, um, there's an outstanding action. Um, you will be aware that I'm, I'm changing a role, um, and obviously Sarch is um, looking at um, replacement and, and where this, um, the housing work um, will sit um, for that. So, so we definitely will get to that outstanding action. As I say, it's just a, a resourcing um, issue at the moment. Sarch, you want to say anything? Oh, well, I was just going to. Um, one of the things that we've been really, I've been really grateful for is understanding the intent of council with that outstanding action. Because I think about how to apply that or to delegate that work to a person, it'd be useful to think what is it council is hoping to achieve and it's quite could be this or this at, at, at the moment. So that would be very helpful to me about whether or not it's a staff member or we get somebody in and do it, what is the end goal with it? Or uh, I mean I think listening to Tim's comments, I think frankly you're baying at the moon because the market is the market, and and the unintended consequences of trying to manipulate it are uh, endless. And I and I certainly, if, if staff are looking for direction from council, I, I think a conversation on the fly in this morning is not the way to do it. Um, I, I, what I was referring to was that thing that's already outstanding, actually, and not. Um, Schoolships do the suggestion today, but it was more in regards to the yeah, outstanding action being the working with sector partners in the region to build a full picture of the housing model for Central Tago and look for opportunities to collaborate to achieve better housing outcomes for the district. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, Sasper, we had more of this conversation before this meeting. Um, I suspect that's the kind of outcome that we reflected on earlier in the piece. Is that still a relevant outcome to um, pursue and to what extent? So that I can be very clear in my direction back to start and um, that I'm expressing the views that council wanted with that purposes. And just to add to that, it could be something as simple as council wanting us to um, find out what other um, opportunities there are for our residents. And, and Tamara, I think you, you raised one recently around a government grant that first home. Um, buyers can get and like how can advertise it 
or it could be something more intensive. And we have, as you're all aware, spent a lot of time with Kāinga Ora, um, trying to, to work with them and, and get a partnership going with, with Cromwell. So it might be that you, you want us to beat that drum a bit more um, and have those conversations and try influence policy um, at the national level. So Sanchi says it could be something quite small, or you want you might want us to do something quite big, and that does obviously impact resource and time. And it may not be as relevant now because we've yeah. got all of the other work. So I just I'm going to get a gauge of that. I think someone would be I'm monitoring sure. what happens with QLDC's inclusionary zoning so uni, mm. which I think we could never apply. Here. That's a continuation of the existing policy, anyway. I'm just wondering, there's, a, there's, there's probably a couple of things. Tim picked up mm. the outstanding action and recommendation C, but what is left after our last decision about mm. not going down a secure home form? Is there anything else left in this whole housing effort that, that we haven't picked up? That's the only action that's outstanding. That's the only action outstanding. Um, but going to my earlier comment, I think very early on under the delivery of affordable housing, it, it really was around that trust model. So you may want us to to look at the further which is a separate conversation as well. We had to think of a brief that you'd add a pack two hundred thousand dollars for without a lot of further discussion because there's the yeah. whole range of social housing. Well, it's, not, it's, not, it's not going to come, come out today. Tim, I think you've yeah. got something to add to it. Yeah, thanks. I'm just trying to shape it together. Yeah, we we can say, hey, we've followed the pathway and this is the end of it. But I, I disagree with that because we voted I can't remember a couple of years ago that we'd, we we would have a role in affordable housing. We didn't put an end definition to what that role would be. We had 75% of respondents to our last survey say, hey, you've got a role to play here. And and to say now, well, we've ticked this box, this box and this box and we've reached the end of the road. I disagree. And for me, if facing 75% of the public saying do something, if through our boards we build 15 units that you know, for 360 grand each and they go on the market, um, which is, I repeat, already manipulated in favour of one sector, in my view, if they go on the market and we sell those to the highest bidder and those highest bidders are not our people that currently desperately need to get in here, I believe we've failed our communities. And I think we need to, I'm not saying we're going to fix this today, but I think there needs to be some other some words today that say go away and do this bit of work so we can come back with something properly formulated that says here's an option for how you may wish to deal with the lower end of the development that you may do in terms of price because it would be unforgivable in my view given the steer we've got from our community to do anything other than have a consideration of how do we make sure that if we build affordable housing it gets sold to the right people because otherwise it's a waste of time. Is there a capacity or, and I don't know if this is our role, around that availability of things like grants from Kaimora? Or, I mean, they're incredibly active in this space mm -hmm. at the moment, everywhere else, but not here. So so that's going to start to comment is really getting direction from, from you all as to what you want that to look like. What would you like us to do further? Um, because then that helps start here with the resourcing. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it's also saying is is recommendation C still the right recommendation? Yeah. And when you asked for that, what was it you were expecting to get back? Or is a comment like what um, His Worship was making, does that replace that? Or it's just 